Greetings, Bazala, in the name of the Lord. Um, it's so good to be back again this morning to share the word of God with you. Um, I want us this morning to speak um, about the working or the workings of God or the work of God in our lives. And I know that um, ever since we started the broadcast, we've been speaking passionately about um, the will of God concerning our lives and the will of God concerning the, the time that we are living in, um, especially the year 2020. Um, so I, I have been, I've been reading um, and rereading Jeremiah chapter 29. And, and as I was reading the chapter, it, 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 I had to back up and try and understand um, the story of Jeremiah. And you know, you may be aware that in the past couple of weeks, I've also been ministering uh, passionately about uh, the prophet Jeremiah. And I begged, and I looked at Jeremiah chapter number 28. And so 29 and 28. And, and as I looked at the text, I, I realized that um, there was a, a time, there was a confrontation between the prophet Jeremiah and another prophet named Hananiah. They are found standing in the Jerusalem temple, which is empty because the Babylonians had ransacked the city when Hananiah makes a bold promise. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about how Jeremiah prophesied and spoke to King Zedekiah and spoke about how they were going to be taken captive by the Babylonians. So Hananiah makes a bold promise in that context, and he says God is going to restore Israel in two years. And, 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 and he says all that was stolen and all the people that were forced into slavery, everything will be better in two short years. Um, the tens of thousands of people living in exile will be coming home soon. I, I want to start there. I'm going to make this uh, 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 my introduction. And before we even begin to go to the text, uh, with this background in mind, I want us to start with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God, the one that is powerful. And it's powerful and more powerful and sharper than a double-edged sword. And Father, it pierces and divides the bone and the marrow. This morning, Lord, even as it is released from my mouth, I pray, O oh God, that it may, it may do a great work in our lives that it may shift our thinking and our perspective, that it may actually save and save the lost and reconcile your people back to the heart and the mind of God. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. So uh, in the story of Jeremiah and, and Hananiah, I think one of the things that have made me to be drawn to this text is the fact that, you know, in the time that we are living in, it is easy from the, from the beginning of the year, it's easy for us as, um, as, as prophets and even as ministers to attempt to appease uh, the hearts of the people of God and start to tell them and give them uh, um, fairy tales and release words that we are, are, are claiming are coming from the Spirit of God. And we, 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 we speak them from the context of wanting to actually entertain and scratch the itching ears of the body of Christ and the church and even the people of the world. But where we are reading, uh, 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 we are going to be reading a couple of texts as we go along. We find there's a fight. Like I said earlier, Hananiah makes a promise and he speaks about this ending in two years and the people of God being reconciled and coming back to uh, coming home soon. Jeremiah recognized exactly what kind of promise this was. It, it sounded good in the short term and would make Hananiah and his supporters very popular. Hananiah may have, been, uh, may have believed the pro promise himself. And, 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 it, and it sounds familiar because even in our time, there are many of us as prophets who actually stand up in the midst of the people and we make undertakings and promises that are not founded on the principles of the word of God, neither founded on the rhema word of God, for this time. So we speak because we want to make people feel better. But I have, 
I have come to understand that the workings of God, when God works with us or works through the body of Christ and through the saints of God, he doesn't work because he wants us to be comfortable. And he doesn't speak to us because he wants to appease our conscience and make us feel good all the time. So uh, when Hananiah spoke, I understand the pressure that he might have had to speak, but what he spoke was not true. God had no plans to make everything better in two years. And speaking through Jeremiah, God says to Hananiah, you have made these people trust in a lie. And, and how many people have actually spoken and declared and pronounced and announced in our time and made the people of God and the people of the world to believe in a lie and also have made the gospel of God, of, of Jesus Christ, uh, to be in disrepute because we speak out of tune and we don't speak within the context of what God demands and what God, God wants to be done. So then comes Jeremiah chapter number 29 and against the backdrop of false promises about prosperity and about God's wonderful plan to set everything right in the near future, Jeremiah sends a letter to Babylon that says more or less, all you people are going to be in exile for 70 years. You are going to die in Babylon. Your children are going to, are going to die in, people, in Babylon. So settle in. And, in, and, I, and I like the, the context. It even says, be comfortable where you are and continue to believe in the Lord where you are in the space in which you have been taken because this season is not going to be two years, but this season will be 70 years. And I know you are watching and you are saying, uh, men of God, are you saying this season of COVID-19 will last for 70 years? All I'm saying is, let us as a church be reading ourselves or be preparing ourselves consistently to, to learn to exist in this season without putting words in the mouth of God concerning the season. But let us be able to live according to the precepts and the principles and the concepts and the mandates that God has given to us to live through. So Jeremiah sends a letter uh, even after Hananiah had prophesied. He says, all of you people are going to be in exile for 70 years. You are going to die in Babylon. Your children are going to die in Babylon. So settle in. So whenever we read Jeremiah 29, like it, we read it like it's good news. Uh, uh, we read it like it's, it's just plain and simple. But to the first people who heard these words, they were in tremendous uh, uh, disappointment. And I know as you are watching, also you are saying, Fundis, why are you disappointing us? Because we were believing that uh, uh, this will end soon. I am not a bearer of bad news, but I'm saying even if it does last, even if it does last to, throughout the year and even in the next year, we need to understand that seasons, when they come, they are presented to us and they are presented by the Lord our God and they are allowed by God to come. Sometimes because of our offenses and the things that we have done because of our sins and because of, the, of not being able to obey the principles and the precepts of God. So God makes a declaration. So when we read Jeremiah, but, but we, we need to understand God's people had suffered terribly. They had lost their land, their throne, their temple, and they had been displaced. Before Jerusalem fell in battle, the people had given uh, uh, themselves into cannibalism. They, they, they were then uh, forced march to march about 800 miles and were made to parade literally through a pagan city in which they, they were now considered as the living symbols of the power of the city's God. And they, they were paraded because of their disobedience. And they found themselves being ridiculed. The very same people that God uh, uh, had spoken earlier and said, these are my people chosen by me for this season. They found themselves being paraded because of the sin and the offense and not being obedient to the spirit of God and the mandate of God concerning their lives. So as you read Jeremiah 29, and uh, don't read it as if they were happy about the plans that God had for them. It was into this kind of despair that Jeremiah offered God's promise, uh, uh, even in the midst of problems, in the, even in the midst of, uh, of, uh, of, of being taken over as a seat, even in the midst of being uh, in trouble and in frustration. Jeremiah comes and says, the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you. He says, I have plans for your welfare and, for your, and, 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 and not for your harm, to give you a future and a hope. 
These were not easy words to hear, especially because they were in captivity, especially because their city had been run down and ransacked and it had been burned to the ground. And they hear words that says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for your harm to give you a future and hope. And someone is saying, but Lord, what do you mean you've got a future and a plan for me if I am living in sackcloth and in ashes and and I've got boils on my body and I have no money in in my bank account and I've got no food uh, on my table? What what do you mean uh, you have got good plans for me? Uh, Jeremiah promised that God had a plan that was certain and inevitable, but it will not unfold on, 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 on the people of God's timetable. And I know when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible speaks about there are times and seasons under the sun. It speaks about seasons and it speaks, speaks about times. And God was not going to just act at the whim of the people, but God had his own timetable. It, it would not uh, simply undo uh, 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 Israel's hardships. And the words that, that Jeremiah spoke still will not undo the problem that you are, you are being faced with. But yet his promise is sure to stand. God fully will fully restore his people and bring them out of their desperate situation but he will not do it in the way any of them will have actually planned for it and i like uh, using the analogy that god is a promise keeper whenever he makes a promise he is good to fulfill that promise it does not matter what season you are living in if god has made a promise if god has made an undertaking god will is faithful and just to to be able to fulfill every bit of the word that he has released over your life. I like to quote the scripture that says, the word of the Lord will not come out of his mouth and return to him void without accomplishing what it has been sent out to do. I want you to choose to believe what God has said. All along, when when I was reading Jeremiah, like I was listening to Hananiah as if God would actually work out everything for my benefit in the near future and in ways that made sense to me. This is what I, I always believed also. I would also quote uh, uh, the, the book of Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good, for them that love the Lord and them that are called by his name. But if I am not living within the season and the ambit of the season of God, these things will happen and I'm, I will have to endure a season of hardship because I, I believe in God. God doesn't work through my timetable. I want to keep, I want to take it a step further. So when you read, uh, 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 we, we take Jeremiah 29 out of context and, and, and hear, it, hear in it the promises that we want to receive. Actually, we hear in it uh, what our itching ears want to hear. Actually, we, we take the narrative to own the text and use it without the context that, that, that it was used for. So I need you to understand as a child of God, and even as you are watching the broadcast, I want you to understand that God has a plan for you and God works things in different ways. He works wonders in our time. And when he works wonders, he works them in such a way that sometimes it will confuse you. Sometimes it confounds the wise and com- and, completes, and completely uh, 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 makes us not understand who we are in the larger scheme of things. But what we need to understand is that even though God has spoken, even though God has made a promise, we need to understand that we need to rise above our discouragement. Because sometimes when God speaks, when speaks words, we think he's going to speak a particular word and he speaks something else and we think, what is God talking about? I remember when, when, when Jeremiah was locked up in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the king's court by King Zedekiah. He was in there and he was praying. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And the word of the Lord said to him, call upon me and I will answer. I will show you great and unsearchable things. And and you would have expected, obviously, as a person praying to God and locked up in in the king's court, you would have expected God to rescue you. But God said, no, call upon me and I will answer and I will show you great and unsearchable things. And it means God was saying, I am going to use you. It does not matter where you are. I will use you for my own glory and I will show forth my power. He had already spoken to Jeremiah in the, in the first chapter where he said to him, don't worry about the frowns on their faces. Continue to speak the word of the Lord without mincing words. He had spoken to Jeremiah about uh, uh, destroying. He had spoken to Jeremiah about bringing down. He, has, he had spoken to Jeremiah about building and planting again. So whenever we deal with God, we need to understand that we sometimes 
what we expect will not happen the way we think it should happen because the calendar of God is not our calendar, the workings of God. And, and we, too, we too can rise above discouragement. And, and, and I want to just throw in a couple of points to show you how we can rise above disappointment. Because when the word of God came and said, you are going to go for 70 years, I'm sure everyone else was saying, well, was disappointed and thinking, what kind of a prophet is this that will come and tell us about disappointment? But we need to rise above our disappointment. We need to be honest. And I like the element of honesty. We need to be honest with God. Tell God how we feel. Jeremiah was honest. He felt deceived by God. The word deceived means to be enticed or seduced. Obviously, God has not misled or tricked people, but Jeremiah felt like God had lured him into the ministry only to make him a laughing stock. He felt he was helpless. Uh, he felt like he had been overpowered, like a girl who had been seduced and overpowered by a deceptive lover. He felt ridiculed and offended. His voice was not making a difference. He was crying out for the people to repent, yet they continued towards destruction and judgment. Jeremiah's intense lament was private and, 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 for, and it was meant for God alone. And I want to insist and, and actually emphasize this point that we will prophesy and speak about the rescue. We'll speak about repent, but people will still not repent and God will release his judgment upon the nations of the world. And when it does, it doesn't mean that it doesn't love us anymore, but it means the people of, the people of God have actually deafened their ears towards the message of God. God wants to talk uh, to us, even when we are angry, even when we are upset, and even when we are frustrated. He wants us to tell the truth. A lot of, a lot of dishonesty goes on in, relation, in our relationship with God. Even, 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 even when we pray, we get to God and we become a, 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 a su superficial and we become fanatic and we, we, we don't speak the truth and we don't tell God how we feel. But we need to come to God as we are. And I love Jeremiah. He comes to God and he takes a posture that says, I understand who you are, but right now I am frustrated because I have been preaching to these people and they are not repenting. People always say, we, you can't be angry at God. You can't say those words to God. But we need to understand, we must remember that anger is an emotion. And oftentimes emotions are neither right nor wrong. But they are just emotions that happen because of a current situation. But when we are, emo when we are, when we are emotional, we, we do not run away from the fact that we are still children of God. What we do with our emotion is a separate issue. People are sometimes surprised by... A, 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 a feelings of anger towards God and feeling of, uh, feelings of anger. Uh, they had been praying for their child and their child didn't survive. They were praying for a disease and it did not go away. And they get stressed and get frustrated and people laugh at them and they're asking, where is their God? It is okay to go back to God and tell him how you feel and tell him how you feel. It is important. I love also King David. The Bible says he was a man after God's heart. If you look at the way that he was dealing with God, he spoke to God honestly. He says, uh, he says when, he, when, when, he, when he came back uh, in Ziklag, he found the city was burnt down. And the Bible says he actually went down to the valley and separated himself away from the people of God. And he took the ephod and then he asked the Lord and he said, Lord, should I pursue these people? And if I pursue them, will I catch up with them or will I overtake them? He honestly asked the Lord and it did not mean words. So if we are dealing with God, let's not deal with God from a superficial perspective. Let's deal with God the way that God is. Well, another example is Jesus. When Jesus was on, on, the, on the mount on, on, on Gethsemane, the Bible says he poured out his heart to the Father uh, uh, on the cross. And he also, when he was faced with the cup, he said, Lord, let this cup pass away from me. And he said, but Lord, let not my will be done. Let your will be done. He honestly spoke to God about the feelings that he felt. And he poured out his emotions. And, and when he was pouring out his, his emotions, that's where he got to a place where he understood what God wanted at that time. God doesn't want us to, to, to get stuck in anger and negative feelings that we may have. This is why we should be honest with him. If we are honest with God in prayer, we will feel a sense of deep freedom and we'll find ourselves having deeper relationship with God and less discouragement. I'm saying this because even when we are praying, sometimes we are like we are Pharisee. We, we behave like Pharisees. We walk around with pious words and good words and we don't tell God how we feel. 
But Jeremiah, the man of God, was able to release and to speak to the Lord the way that he felt. Number two, we need to be obedient to God. We need to keep doing what we have been called to do. And it's important for us to remember, when we are obedient to God, it's very, very important for the body of Christ to be obedient to God. It is not the gifts. It is not the works of our hands. But it is being obedient to the spirit of the living God. Because uh, uh, Jeremiah was ready to let go of God and leave him out of all his conversations. But he could not do that. He would not be at peace uh, at doing anything else. God's message, he said, was like a fire that is shut up in his bones. He could not put it out. He could not keep quiet about it. Jeremiah did not preach because he had, he had, he had uh, uh, something to say. But he, because he, he, did not, he, did not, he did not preach because he had to say something. I need to get that right. But he, sp he preached because he had something to say. Not saying it will have destroyed him. And I know we all fall into the same trap. Sometimes we are even afraid to say, I do not know. Like Ezekiel said, when the, when, the, when the spirit of the Lord put him in the valley, he said, son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel said, Lord, I do not know, but you know. And then God said to him, speak to these bones and say bones and, and, say, and, 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 and prophesy to these bones and these bones shall begin to live. So it's critical for us to understand that whenever we deal with God, we deal with God from a perspective uh, uh, that says, I need to obey God whether things are okay. I need to obey God whether the season dictates or not. I need to obey God because God is my king and is my father. Uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, when he spoke, he spoke because he had something to say. He did not just say something. It's important for you to master that and, and be able to, to, to pick it up. You need, you, 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 you need to also understand that uh, 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 pastors uh, uh, keep at the task despite rejection and anger. And I'm using pastors because I am a pastor. A child of God will keep uh, 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 to the task even though they are rejected. Plain and simple. The call of God upon our lives keeps us going. Uh, we, 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 we are always uh, 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 battling. We are always uh, struggling, but we keep going because we understand our call. When you are called, you cannot ignore your call. When you are called, you cannot run away from your call. The call comes first from the heart. It's, it's internal as a result of the continuing draw, drawing or tugging of the Holy Spirit. This conviction is deep within the innermost being of a person. Eventually, it comes. It becomes unshakable. It marks a person's life. Everywhere we go, we are known as pastors and children of God. So let's continue to serve the Lord and obey the voice of the Lord because the workings of God will work because we are obedient. And we are obedient not because things are okay. We are obedient because obedience is better than sacrifice. That's what Samuel said. It is important for us to act in and act according to what God says and obey the voice of the Lord. The work of the ministry is demanding and difficult for a man to enter it without a sense of divine calling. The workings of God are understood for, by those who have the calling of God upon their lives. And it is important for us to understand that nothing less than a definite call from God could ever give a man success also in what we do in ministry. It is the obedience to the spirit of the living God that pushes us to the next level. And number three, we need to be watchful. Know that the Lord is with us. The Lord does not forsake us. So when Jeremiah says 70 years in exile, it doesn't mean that because you are in a foreign land, then God does not know or forgets about you. But God is actually judging the people of God for not being obedient to his spirit. But it doesn't change the fact that they still remain the chosen people of God. They've been taken to Babylon, yes, but they are still the children of God. And Jeremiah realized that he wasn't alone. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 11, the Bible says, But the Lord is with me like a violent warrior. He was not on the losing side. He was going to win because the Lord was with him like a mighty warrior. God would deal effectively on his own way and time with all the enemies of God. But we need to consistently be watchful, be consistently, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Even in our discouragement, we need to look inward. To, we, 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 we need to forget about our frustrations. We need to look upward to a God who has not abandoned us. 
He is with us. He is always with us. He's the Emmanuel God, God with us. He is at present tense. He's the God that is with us all the time. He doesn't leave us nor forsake us. He's consistently holding our hands and walking with us. Can you imagine the difference it would make in our outlook and our relationship with God if we always consciously understood that God was present? Imagine going through a difficult uh, a business meeting or a board meeting and going through a, a season uh, of lack and feminine and confusion and understanding that the one that is with me is the God Almighty who is beyond and above all things. I am able to do everything because I know God is with me. A, a picture a, entering into a stressful presentation, knowing that God is walking with you. Envision confronting the status quo in your nation with the mighty arm of the Lord surrounding you. Knowledge of God's presence can help us accomplish a, a significant things despite discouragement. It provides for us courage, number one. Number two, it provides valor. It provides guts. It prov provides strength. It provides tenacity and perseverance. I remember when Gideon was found in a cave hiding and believing that he is the smallest, he's the leakiest, he had been defeated and his tribe had been defeated. The angel of the Lord came to him and said, Arise, mighty man of valor. He looked at his stature and his position, but God does not depend on your position. He doesn't depend on your, on your condition. It doesn't depend on where you've been taken. It doesn't depend on pandemics, but God is with you despite the fact that you may feel like God is not there. But when God provides courage in these seasons, he gives you valor. He gives you guts. He gives you strength. He gives you tenacity and perseverance. My favorite author, A.W. Tozer, writes and he says, living in the glow of God's presence will enable you to fight on despite uh, discouragement. Living in the glow of God's presence means you are living within the presence of God. The Apostle Paul makes it and states it very clearly. He says, in him we live, we move, and we find our being. It is important for us to understand that the Lord is with us. The workings of God in our lives are not the same as the workings of men. The doing of men in our lives are not the same as the doing of God. It doesn't matter which season we are going through, whether we are in Babylon for two years or we are in Babylon for 70 years, the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us, but he shall be with us until the end of time. And we also need to be worshipful. We need to be in a place of worship. And I understand when you are saying, but how can I sing a song when I am, when I am in captivity? But what makes a, 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 our relationship with God tick is that even when we are in captivity, we don't forget who our God is. Daniel and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the three Hebrew boys, they used to actually uh, uh, kneel and face uh, Jerusalem and they would pray three times a day and they would worship the Lord even when they were in trouble. And you remember Paul and Silas, they were in jail after being beaten. The Bible says they began to pray and to praise. And the Bible also says, and the prisoners were listening to them. They did not just hear them, but their worship shook the jail and shook uh, the bonds in jail and opened the gates because even though they were in trouble, they did not stop worshiping. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's despair turned to joy. His defeated attitude turned to triumph. His dismay to courage. The key that unlocked the door to victory was praise. Jeremiah triumphantly proclaimed in Jeremiah 20 and 13. He said, sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise is one of the weapons in the Christian arsenal against which Satan has no defense. When we praise, we acknowledge that he is in charge. He can do what he wants, uh, when he wants, and how he wants. When you are going through that season, the workings of God are going to be obvious to you. The doing of God will, is going to be obvious. You, everyone will see that that is not the hand of man, but that is the hand of God. We believe in the workings and the doings of God. God is working and his mighty arm is upon you. When he does, always remember, God does what he wants and when he, and what and when he wants and how he wants to do it. It is the season of the doing of God. I want you to be encouraged and understand that when you are in a place of praise, begin to praise the Lord despite the situation you are faced with. Begin to praise the Lord also in Babylon, even though you know now it's going to be 70 years, not two years. Continue to praise the Lord and give him all the glory. Praise is more than just acknowledging God for the good that comes our way. But praise is accepting from God 
all that comes our way, both the good and the bad. The praise we offer when things don't go our way. It is important for me to then stress that the, the praise that we offer when things don't go our way is far more precious to God than the praise we offer when all is well. What I'm saying is that when we are in Babylon and we are stuck in Babylon, we are there for 70 years, we need to engage the gear of praise. We need to praise the Lord and don't stop praising God. Uh, uh, don't stop believing what God is doing because praise will do just these four things that I'm going to end with. Praise will always recognize a provider. Praise takes our minds off our situation and focuses them on our God. It gives God the right to rule and to reign in our lives uh, uh, how he sees fit. It acknowledges that God knows more about what he's doing than we do. It accepts that God can take all the bad stuff of life and make something beautiful out of it. Praise, number two, will acknowledge a plan. A few chapters later, Jeremiah records uh, words to Israel. For I know the plans I have for you. That's Jeremiah 29. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your welfare, not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. 29 and 11. God weaves a tapestry of our lives. He weaves like he's making a mat. We don't always see the finished product. Sometimes to get to the end, we, we have our shares of difficulties. That is, I want to emphasize sometimes, not all the times. Sometimes to get to the end, we have our shares of difficulties. When we realize God has a plan, we have two options. We can fight it or we can embrace it. I feel like prophesying to you uh, this morning that even though you are in this season, do not fight it, but embrace the season. Number three, praise accepts the present. Praise is based on a total and joyful acceptance of the present as part of God's loving, perfect will for us. Praise is not based on what we think or hope will happen in the future, but we praise the Lord not for what we expect will happen in our, you know, around us, but we praise him for what he is and how he and how we how, how we are right and how we are right now number 4 praise releases power prayer opens the door of god's power to move into our lives but the prayer of praise will release more of god's power than any other form of petition the psalmist wrote in psalms 22 and verse number 3 he said but thou art holy o thou that inhabits the praise of israel god actually dwells and inhabits and resides in our praise God's power and presence is near when we praise him. So what am I saying? I'm saying the workings of God will confuse and confound the enemy. Even though we may be in Babylon, you need to understand. Praise the Lord because the praise of the Lord will inhabit the praises of God, the, the presence of the Lord. Uh, the Lord will inhabit the praise of Israel. So God will dwell in your praise. God will inhabit in your praise. God will reside in your praise even in this season. So believe in the workings of God. I want us to pray and I want us to pray and believe the Lord that he is our God and it is at work. Father, we thank you for the doing of God. We thank you for the workings of God. We thank you for the work of the cross that you are doing in our lives. Father, make us understand, oh God, that whether we are taken for two years or 70 years, but you are still at work, God. And this season, oh God, we shall come through with our praise and we will praise you until we die. And we believe all of this, oh God, in the name of Jesus, the Lord, our God. Amen.